Welcome back, everyone. This is our probably sixth or seventh episode of the podcast, and today we have Braden Dennis, right? The CEO and founder of Stratosphere.io. Hi, Braden. Hi, and Matt. Thank you so much. Uh, we've been trying to set this up for a couple of weeks now, and uh, I'm happy to see you guys. Yeah, and we are happy to see you, and thank you very much to uh, you know for accepting our invitation. We have been using Stratosphere for some time now, and we have been in contact with you, and we really enjoy the service. So we thought it was gonna be a very nice hour spending spending it together and talking about your story and Stratosphere and just getting to know each other. And uh, so maybe if I can start and ask the first question. Um, I've seen that you are an environmental engineer, so we do share a little bit of this in the past. At least we are all engineers here, but then, you know, this is an example of how life can take you to other things after your degree, right? So how did it happen for you? What was the, the story and the process there? Uh, we've, we've gathered three nerdy engineers in one call <laughs> here. It's perfect. Um, so ultimately, right, like, an engineering degree, no matter where you, where you get it in the world, is is a, a an accomplishment. It is it is difficult. It requires multi, using all kinds of parts of your brain, and it says that you can commit to starting and finishing something very difficult. That's what any degree says about you, and especially an engineering degree, is because uh, you know in the world people want to just be confident that you can start and finish hard things because the, you know what they say, the hard thing about hard things, it, it, it challenges you to, to make prioritizations in your life about what you, what you want to accomplish. And so, uh, yeah, I'm glad we can get three nerdy engineers here on the call. Now with finance, I mean, there's kind of, there's a nice parallel in a lot of this stuff where, Math definitely helps. Like having a, a foundation of just working with numbers and be, not being scared of numbers. Like the notion that math is like you know, some scary concept or if anything, it's the most beautiful thing because it, it, it always tells the truth. The numbers always tell the truth, assuming that the, <laughs> the source is correct. And so um, – I think that there's a lot of parallels still between finance and, and engineering. And you see a lot of engineers go into all kinds of uh, careers around numbers and math. For me, it was simply, I was just trying to build something for myself while I was working as an engineer. I was trying to build a data visualization tool and a place that aggregated numbers that I actually cared about. Because you guys know, Anywhere pretty much on the internet, you can for free and in seconds pull all three financial statements. You know, you can pull an income statement, you can pull a balance sheet, you can pull a cash flow statement. You don't need a Bloomberg terminal. You don't need to subscribe to some expensive, you know, $20,000 a year service to pull that data. What you can't get very quickly is the numbers that actually move the business. And I'll give you guys an example. My stratosphere, we raised uh, our first round of funding from venture capital. And every month, I have to send our investors an update. And I just send four or five numbers that are important to the business. Are they a balance sheet? No. Is, is it a cash flow statement? No. Revenue is just one of those numbers. And then all of them other, all the other ones are like engagement, um, you know, how many companies we have under our coverage, page speed, you know, feature development. Those are the things that actually move our business and not like earnings per share. Like it's, it's, it's irrelevant. And oftentimes with large public companies, this is no different. If you look at Airbnb, what moves their business? It's number of nights booked Really booking rate, like how much it costs to book a night uh, uh, in aggregate across their platform. Those two numbers move the whole business. For Netflix, it's number of subscribers and average revenue per user moves the entire business. Um, and so pulling those numbers into a financial model takes an entire afternoon if you go back on historical data. And that's the problem that I really wanted to fix. So it was kind of like a, a happy accident and... Uh, and a, a foray into entrepreneurship, but just simply to scratch my own itch. And I think that that's more common than, than not. 
Right. So this is why on Stratosphere we can get also those numbers. Yes, there, there are the, the usual, let's say, numbers, the financial numbers, and then also KPIs and, and others, right? That's right. Yeah. The, these examples are like, if you're looking at Costco, you know, how many warehouses do they build? Or how many locations do they have? How many paying uh, members do they have? Those, those are the things that are really important if you're going to model out what you think Costco is worth or what you think Costco can be worth the next 10 years. You're thinking, okay, how many warehouses can they open per year? Somewhere around 10 and 12. Um, and what has that been historically? How much is the average price of a membership? Can they hike that? Like, you don't really have to multiply that many numbers to figure out what the top line can be in 10 years for a simple business like like Costco. But those are the numbers that you're going to need to triangulate if you want to come up with that number. It's not difficult, but you're going to need to, to come up with those numbers. Um, and so, yeah, that's, that's ultimately why we have taken the extremely difficult task of aggregating it at scale. And uh, it's, it's, had its, it's had its fun challenges for sure when you're trying to clean data. And how long has it taken you guys to go from you know the the idea to something that was you know working for you first of all and then to actually something that you made it into stratosphere and you know kind of like giving a service to other people a great question i originally had a really bad a really really bad version of it in uh making it at home during the pandemic and it was in the fall of 2020 I, uh, I just launched it. I made it free. Um, I, I added a paid tier for people to get like analytics beyond just like my own research and data. Um, and I was like, holy shit, mom, people are random people on the internet are paying me money. Um, and that's kind of the, that's kind of the moment, right? Where it's like, hmm, someone will pay for this. Interesting. Uh, two, I enjoy this. Interesting. And, and three, what can it be if I keep working on it and make it better? And, and it's like everything you, you work on, right? You're always trying to make it better, no matter what you do in your career, always trying to make it just a little better, especially if it's a software product, right? Like you can already start to vision and, and, and map out in your mind what it's going to look like in just a quarter or two um, and, and how it can keep getting better. And, of course, we when you build and iterate like this, break a lot of stuff. We break things probably far too often, but I'd rather move and break versus wait and refine. Um, you know, people who build companies and then you know have some big hoopla launch. I think that's typically the wrong way to go. I think you should just build it get feedback as quick as possible because what you think people want in your mind and what people actually want might not be the same thing. And so that's why you have to get it in front of people like you guys uh, as soon as possible. And then you can take their feedback and, and make it better. This is something that of, often happens with entrepreneurs that they build something for themselves. I mean, Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak is the famous example. And then others also find it useful. So when was the first time that, that you started looking into investing? Uh, because of mm. course, this is, this is much uh, later, right? In, uh, during the pandemic, you already built something. So when, when did you actually start saying, oh, investing is, is interesting and uh, the data is, is like the oil? For, for Yes, exactly. Yeah. Uh, no, it's a great question because obviously it stems from the start of me becoming an investor first before uh, building a product for investors. And it was when I was working as an engineering intern um, I was in first or second year university, so I was only 17 years old. I was just turning 18 in August of that summer in my internship, and I had already prepared exactly what I was going to do for my portfolio because that was the age requirement to, to have a registered uh, tax-sheltered account here in Canada. So I was ready to go. Um, I, I, I'm lucky and I'm very fortunate and I'm very grateful that 
had that aha moment so that I could start right at the age of 18. Like this is the dream, right? You want long-term compounding. Um, and the reason that that happened is I'll never forget is a coworker of mine gave me a book uh, about basically um, just how to invest in index funds. It's basically like a John bogle type book mm-hmm. um, on this is what the market can produce historically. Um, if you dollar cost average in the S&P 500, you can expect this. Uh, the market typically does, you know, I'm giving the highlights of the book. The market typically does 10%. But the market never does 10%, right? On average, the market does around 10% on the S&P. But it almost never does 10% on the S&P if you look historically. Like, uh, I think, what, like 9.9% historically on the S&P 500 of the last 150 years. I think in, since 1968, there has only been one year the S&P 500 has finished between 8 and 10%. We'll look it up. Since 1960, only one year has the S&P actually finished in that 8 to 10% on a, on a calendar year, uh, which yeah. is an arbitrary time frame anyways, but on a calendar year. So what, what can you extrapolate from that, that the market is extremely volatile? that on the long term, um, it produces extraordinary returns and uh, for those who are willing to, to be patient. And so that really kind of put a bug in my ear. And I went on the next five, seven years just holding broad-based, low-cost index funds. It's the most beautiful thing. 99% of the people should do that. Like it, it's the most wonderful thing, especially if you're paying mutual fund fees historically. Like you get broad global diversification for a few basis points and fees. How amazing is that? Like that's that's incredible. And then of course, as I get, you know, more mature as an investor, I started to pick individual securities as well in addition to uh to the broad-based index funds um that's been that's been a great experience as well but it's it's not for everyone especially if you're um investing with your emotion (laughs) investing with your stomach and not your brain then you should probably just be in index funds and most people probably should but uh you know you know how it is yeah, and in general, I think, I mean, we have been talking about this topic with many other investors. There are several things that are difficult, right? So the emotions, right? Because maybe one year your index fund like does minus 2% and you sell, and then you're going to buy it when after he has done plus 10%, right? So then that's the worst that you can do. And then on top of that, it's really like accepting that in a way you have to live below your means for a certain number of years before you can actually then take advantage of all of these years of compounding and live a good life, maybe retire early and do whatever you want. So there are several steps that are difficult on average for for people. And that's why I think the barrier is very high to enter such such world. It's high uh, of a barrier mentally. Um, and what I try to tell people is that it's not a high barrier financially. <laughs> Um, because what's a, you know, Vanguard broad-based ETF share cost, like 30 bucks, um, for no fees, you can buy it for free. You're going to pay like three, four basis points a year. Like the barrier or excuses financially, I don't believe exist at all anymore. Um, as long as you have access to a, to a brokerage account and you have an internet connection, um, mentally, is a it is a method of delayed gratification right like you can't you can't have everything right you can't you can't be regularly dull cost averaging and then have you know fifteen hundred dollar bmw payments every month like you you can't have both of those things depending on your income and if you can't have both of them then then great you got a nice income you have to make some certain decisions about uh what you want to do long term and the fifteen hundred dollar a month BMW is causing you more stress than than good. Then maybe it's time for a, a shift in how you treat finance, 
your financial life. Yeah, and that's what's great about the thing the, the recent years that it everything has become easier and easier, right? Internet, all these right. platforms, online brokerage accounts. If you just want to do it, you can do it now. And then on top of that, you have these other platforms like Stratosphere that in a way can help even more investors making the right choices. And on top of that, I think I just want to leverage a little bit on that because it's becoming easier because of all these platforms and internet. There's a lot on YouTube, for example. Of course, as with anything, you can find good and bad advice, uh, but then it's up to you to decide, you know, whom to listen to. And then I've seen that you also are in the Canadian Investor Podcast. So in a way, you are an engineer, you're an entrepreneur, you're an investor, but you also like to talk about investing. Your Twitter ac account also has probably six or 7,000 followers and you talk about stocks and you use Stratosphere. So in a way, everything is coming together, right? You are investing, you are creating your platform, you are giving it to others either for free or depending on which plan they use for, for some money, of course. But then you also try to talk about what you do and advertise in a way or help people kind of like talking about investing and making it clear that it's it's there and it's possible to to do there is a very famous quote uh for people who build products um which is build it and they will come and it is a complete lie um because <laughs> if you build it they won't come. No one will. No one will know it exists. You could have the best thing since sliced bread. But if you, if it is the best thing since sliced bread, and you build it, you tell people about it, and they might, they they might come. If they do and they like it, they might tell their friends. Um, build it and they will come is just a complete lie unless you've built something that's like frame-breaking, earth-shattering, chat GPT, you know, some product that's like going to revolutionize the world, then maybe people will come. Um, but generally, you, you got to build it and then tell people and then they might come. And for, for me, that's always been how I, how I treat it. I have fun with the podcast. Um, it's a great business as well. Like we, it's, a, it's an advertising media business that, again, complete fluke that that happened, but it is, it is a business. And so it all ties together. Um, it seems like I kind of planned it all. I swear to you guys, I did not plan any of it. It just kind of happened. And if you keep every day working on something you're passionate about and talking to people about it, making content about it, then, you know, things, opportunities will kind of come to you, but it, it uh, you, you gotta you gotta tell people about it you gotta you gotta tell them and then they might come they might come check out your content uh if you don't enjoy it, it just won't show up every day so if if you really double down triple down on your passions as much as it as cliche as it is then you're gonna show up every day you're gonna have the consistency and it's not gonna feel like work and you'll see some nice results yeah and and they might talk about it on uh, on a youtube channel who knows right. uh, yeah exactly <laughs> exactly <laughs> uh, so um so when when you were building this during the pandemic i i guess uh, i don't know were, were you alone uh, or together with others how how did you build a team then afterwards uh, because now you have uh, seven there are us, a few yeah. people at south Street. yeah seven of us in total right now uh, if you include the podcast it's 11 of us in total um, and it started with just me hacking stuff together, learning tech again, didn't think it would amount to much, but what else was I going to do? I mean, <laughs> I wasn't like, I don't really watch that much TV. So like, I don't really know what I was going to do. So I just started to try to learn. And I always knew that I wanted to learn how to actually build tech. Um, and so I scraped together something very, very bad. Uh, which should never be seen again. But because of that first iteration and some initial traction, I convinced my longest time and one of my best friends in the world, I convinced him to, to come help me out. And he, he was working with big tech, um, you know, great job. And so that's always a big leap for, for uh, very skilled tech talent. 
to uh, to to make that leap and and, and trust in me. And so, uh, our our chief technology officer Ryan White, uh, I, I love the guy to death. He's one of my best friends, and uh, he made the the leap to come help me build out something real and scalable with the correct infrastructure. And that was really the genesis of what it is today. In the fall, we acquired. Uh, another website called 10kreader.com. And it was he he had built something awesome. His name's Kevin. He's one of the now co-founders of Stratosphere. He had built something very very nice, and it miss it, it hit something. A lot of things that our platform sucked at. We had built some amazing stuff. He had built some amazing stuff. It was like you put them together, and it was. 10 times better because the things we were doing well, we were doing well, but the things we really sucked at, he was doing really well. And so uh, we combined uh, platforms with him in the fall of last year, pleaded an actual proper acquisition and Aqua hired him on full time onto the team. And so that has been brilliant for us, Kevin, uh, absolute legend. And then uh, our, our fourth other co-founder, so it's actually four of us, um, his name is Adrian, and he's a, a professional accountant. And there's no one more specific and with better attention to detail than him. He leads scraping this data, this granular data at scale, um, because at first it was very manual. It's become more technologically advanced, more technologically advanced with him and our tech team. And so we just have the right guys with the right talent at the right time and so i'm very grateful of, of them and uh and our three other team members we've onboarded recently as well are doing doing fantastic yeah we actually discovered uh 10k reader just by chance on, on oh yeah on github yeah yeah nice uh and we were we were so amazed by by the beauty of the website so yeah it, it was really really good and uh, yeah, I mean, and and also all all the data. What, what we or I personally actually liked a lot uh, was the fact that it's not so easy, or I don't know, maybe impossible to to find at at this price tag uh, thirty five mm -hmm. years of financial data. Uh, yeah, so I, I was years. yeah thirty five. I, I was kind of impressed because. You know, ten years is fine. Twenty years you can find, but more you it's it's very difficult. So when I when I found that, I was like, oh no, Matt, we we have to, <laughs> to subscribe to this. This is amazing. So I, I was yeah, really I'm satisfied happy. too. Right, it, you go on like a company that's been public for a really long time, like Apple or something, and you you just scroll along the financial statements and just see visually like revenue line like go for 35 years nothing nothing is more satisfying to the brain than that especially if you like data yeah and also so easy to use and visual you can also you try it on the ipad or even on your mobile i mean it just works and it's uh it's very easy and nice to to work with mobile is still a bit of a work in progress we'll say that but uh the desktop looks pretty nice what are your uh, your next goals with Stratosphere? I mean, apart from the mobile and, of course, tuning it here and there, but do you see something very different in the future or just, you know, this service, just scaling it up, up and up and then enjoy it? A great question. Uh, it's funny because up until about two months ago, it's been primarily retail investors that have been like, this is amazing. I need to subscribe. Um, now we're getting, you know, People running big amounts of money, family offices, large funds, sell side research companies are saying, um, you're only charging what? <laughs> like, <laughs> you're like, okay. Uh huh, okay. Uh, so that's, that's been a really big game changer for us on the business side and like our strategy moving forward is because like, it's, it's, it's an amazing terminal for, for retail, but it's also a really powerful for professional investors and they don't need to spend the 20 grand a, a year on a Bloomberg, for example. Um, so that, that's, that's been good on the, on the business side. On the product side, we are 
waiting for Microsoft right now. Hopefully, by the time this comes out, it'll be available. An Excel plugin. So you'll just be able to open up on the right side pane of your, your Excel. And you can just pick any company and boom, it's going to pull not only all the financials, all the ratios, but all of those key point indicators and segment revenue lines as well, all the way back as far back as you want to go annually, quarterly, whatever you want. Um, because although you can do that right now to export it into Excel from the platform, something this industry just loves about hanging out in Excel. And I get it. I totally understand. And so that's, that's coming out. Uh, it's just waiting for approval in the Microsoft store right now. Um, so that's going to be a, a nice, a nice feature launch. And then just expanding our coverage on that granular data all the way out to like 4,000 largest global companies by market cap We're at about 650, 700 today. Uh, we're going to scale that out uh, into 4,000 because we've built a tool that's probably worth more than Stratosphere itself to actually scrape this data at scale. Um, and so, uh, again, some smart guys on my team. I, don't, I wouldn't have been able to figure any of this out. So uh, I, I, I count my lucky stars. You, you can have a, a, a scrape as a service uh, side business yeah. <laughs> inside Stratosphere. <laughs> yeah, seriously. Yes, yeah, some of these sell side shops because they'd rather have it internally in house than uh, for now, anyways. Until they maybe trust that our data is legit. Um, yeah, they're gonna they're gonna want to scrape uh, scraping as a service. I bet. <laughs> yeah, another thing that I was really impressed indeed was the global reach. It's not you know very often is just most data are U.S. centric. So finding, you know, very easily finding data for all the European uh, stocks, for example, or Japanese or whatever was really, really good. Yeah, so, you see how their logos uh, come in too? I like that. The, the yeah, logo yeah. comes up when you search it. You're right, because I think that, I mean, there's a lot of really high quality companies in, in Europe and... The data coverage on even some of the large caps, like an ASML, for instance, like there should be no data gaps for ASML. It's like two hundred and fifty billion dollar company. Um, yeah. Even though, like, yeah, it's a Dutch company, like, doesn't mean that it shouldn't have the highest quality data because it's one of the highest quality companies on the planet. So we we've always had the approach of just just nail the data market cap down. Um, in terms of prioritization, and uh, it doesn't matter if it's where if it's an Indian stock, European stock, Japanese stock, Canadian, U.S. stock, it really doesn't matter because there's high quality companies that do business on every corner uh, corners of this earth. So, um, yeah, I'm glad you recognize that. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, there are, for example, some uh, companies that are not listed in the U.S. Some some Swiss companies, for example, I mean right, Nestle right. or or others, exactly. they are not Nestle, listed in yeah. the U.S. And if you if you miss that, you may miss something big. <laughs> uh, and if you don't have the data easily, then uh, how should you invest in these very big companies? Right? It's. Uh, I was so looking at it, a bunch of Polish companies yesterday. And I had never looked at a bunch of Polish. Li there is a pool of really high quality compounders in, on the on the I guess the Warsaw Exchange, right? The Warsaw. Uh, uh, dot yes, WA. You know better than us. <laughs> uh, dot WA. So I'm assuming it's Warsaw. Uh, dude, like some of the, I was looking at these things, and I'm like, how is it so cheap? And it's like, oh, it's because it's. Only listed in Poland. That's why. Like that's why it's so cheap. Mm -hmm. No one's looking at this stuff. So uh, yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, and actually, we have chatted with um, a European dividend growth investor. He goes by EDGI on Twitter and also on YouTube. Yeah, I think he's originally from the Netherlands, but he lives in Poland. And um, every now and then, I think he tweets about exactly what you said. Well, that's that's fun. He's shocked. Yeah, the, I just looked it up the Warsaw Stock Exchange. Uh, it's a member of the Federation of European Securities Exchange. Anyways, this was just an, an experience I had yesterday where I was looking at some companies that I'm like, hmm, free cash flow per share is going up and to the right and trades for, you know, 12 times cash flow. Like, that seems pretty reasonable. 
like it. Yeah, I think this is also an example of how such a tool that is surprisingly cheap, as you said, and as other have have recognized, <laughs> can make investing. Watch, watch what you watch what you say. The the, the price is going to be flipped up in no time at this at this rate. Like if if everyone keeps <laughs> telling me it's too cheap, I mean, I'm going to have to do something about it. No, I'm just kidding. I mean, of course, I mean you are the the co-founder and CEO, so you know whatever you decide. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> You, but, you have an inside track. Yeah. <laughs> but I was just thinking that it makes investing easier for people like us. But on top of that, it also allows you to discover potentially cheaper and cheaper investments, exactly because it's harder even for the normal investor or good investor that has access to some services to then go and see exactly like what's happening in, in Poland or what's happening in France. I mean, France is a little bit easier. There are more famous companies, but I, I doubt it that everyone knows about all the companies that are in France. I mean, now Louis Vuitton, of course, is all over the place, right? It's the, the world richest man now, but who knows, right? There are so many good companies also in Europe and of course also in Asia. Yeah, but even LVMH, not listed in the US, right? Exactly. So, so even in that case, I mean, there are these huge uh, companies. In the case of LVMH, you know, it was clearly a compounder. <laughs> uh, and uh, you, you have to have the data and you have to trust the data. And uh, for somebody like me, for example, it's, it's very... Uh, it's kind of addictive now that I have all this data to, to you know, try to, to understand, you know, what are the drivers of value creation? Can we, can we test some ideas? So it's amazing. It's, it's like giving, you know, the, the toys to, <laughs> to, <laughs> to investors. What I was telling you, man, you, you get a bunch of nerds on the call here and uh, that's what happens. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, you're right, though. Like, I, I'm just looking up here on... Uh, on LVMH and you, you go down to the segments and KPIs and it breaks out wine and spirits, fashion and leather, perfume and cosmetics, watches and jewelry, uh, selective retailing, whatever that means. You, you, and you go to their KPIs and you see the organic growth on all of them as well. And um, it's just like clearly this business is onto something just visually because we provide like little spark lines um, for each of those segments. And you're just like, Clearly, they're on to something. Clearly, pricing power is there. And uh, I mean, lots of people are looking at LVMH. But if you're looking at European stocks that are only listed there or Canadian stocks that are only listed there, Australian stocks that are only listed there, there's just going to be less eyeballs. It's just, it just is what it is. There's going to be less eyeballs. There's going to be less fund flows. That's a big big factor both on the passive and active management side there's going to be less fund flows it doesn't necessarily mean automatically that they're cheap stocks um it could mean that they're a, a good hunting ground actually yes it's very well known that there is a home country bias uh, yes, in investing yeah. like if you are yeah if you're canadian you look at canadian stocks first but then in the world somehow, of course, since since the US are, you know, that there's more data about the US, the biggest companies are, but yes. So uh, just a lot of people just look there, sometimes for good reasons, but at other times, and uh, not for so good reasons, uh, like, uh, like emotionally, just you, you look there, but yeah. okay, what about the rest? But also uh, you have to have the data to, to look elsewhere. So you may want to, to invest in Europe, but if you are American, let's say, or you are from that part of the world and you want to invest in France, you may not want, but if you want, then you discover these amazing compounders. I mean, uh, some of these luxury brands, of course, in the last 20 years, they performed better than most of uh, the companies in the S&P 500. It's, uh, it really allows, I, I think that uh, unlocks something that is just so amazing for, for investors. So uh, I think since there are no so, so, so many tools like this, I think that uh, people should really, really look into Stratosphere. Uh, it's, it's, uh, you, you need to do my marketing material. Uh, you're doing oh, well, a fantastic let's talk about job. It. <laughs> 
Uh, no, I really appreciate you saying that. Thank you. Uh, I know, I know you're, you're on the pod, so you're, you're being nice, but I know that you actually use it. So I appreciate oh, yeah, that. Yeah. And, uh, I, I thank you very much. I, I was just going back in my mind to what we said at the beginning about the, I mean, why investing is hard for, for some people. Now, I think we, we hope that it's clear that the tools are there. Uh, both to do your own research and maybe if you're just interested in investing, uh, you don't need to have 35 years. I'm not sure. I mean, we like to to do the region. It definitely helps. But of course, having 10 years and the current data is already a very, very good start. And then you have all these um, brokerage accounts that you can open. Like We use interactive brokers. Fairly easy to open it also from Europe. Of course, there are some limitations on the things we can buy, but more or less we can you know, buy kind of everything, so we don't complain too much. Um, but one of the things that we talk with Guy is that, because we, we talk to many people, and uh, of course we have some friends back in Italy, and we also have many friends in Europe, some also in the US, we, we have both lived in the US, and there's definitely a different um, culture when it comes to investing between Europe and the US. I think Europe is some years behind, I, I don't know how many, we can say 20, 30, I'm not sure. Decades. Decades, yeah. yeah, some decades. And I feel that without, you know, being mean or anything, that even when I talk to people in Europe, there is this different understanding about investing than what I have when I talk to my American friends. And one of the things that is very hard to understand is that if you are investing and maybe you are investing for your retirement, you know, like, for example, you, we have talked to some investors that don't, don't believe in the pension scheme. So they're like, you know, I don't believe in that. I just want to take care of my own, my own retirement. Or maybe they're like, I don't want to retire when I'm 70. I want to retire when I'm 50. Um, there, are, there are several reasons. One of the things that people struggle, I think, at least in Europe, to understand is that what we say with guys, like your capital is your best employer, right? If you are building a portfolio that kind of pays you an income and gives you a cash flow over the years, that's going to be perfect, right? Whereas at least in Europe, I don't know, Guy, if you agree, we always stumble across people that say, no, but then, you know, you buy a stock, you make a, a gain, then you sell, and then what? That's, that's the wrong mindset, right? You just have to invest, hopefully, for the, for the very, very long term. Sometimes, of course, you have to sell, but then the idea is to reinvest the capital in a better, uh, in a better stock or in a better investment and then benefit from the gain or, or the dividends and so forth. So I think... I don't know, this just came to my mind and I don't know what's your thought on this, if I'm saying or if you're saying something uh, weird or if you uh, agree, if you just have any thoughts that can help our viewers and our listeners about, the, about this idea. The answer is it's impossible to really put it on to, to one thing and, and I'm not European, so I don't know, like culture-wise, I suspect that it all comes down to just basic education uh i i would would assume that it roots from from education because no one is born an investor you're not born an investor you're 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 born you don't even know how to feed yourself you know like you don't even know basic human function when you're born um and so you you certainly don't know how to invest and so how are you going to learn that and ultimately it's not really from traditional education either because, uh, you know, we don't learn it here, um, traditional education. But what you do learn, uh, and maybe in, in the culture, is you have to you know, plant seeds now to retire later. Or else you're just, you know, it's drilled into your head enough, the problem they just don't tell you how to do it. And so I wish that they, I wish that they would tell you, people how to at least start figuring out how to do it, but at least they instill the problem into your head. If you don't plant these seeds now, you will be on the streets at the age of 65 with no job and no nest egg. So no one wants to end up in that situation, right? So we don't maybe necessarily have the tools out of the gate. Uh, or the education, but we understand the problem. And, you know, anytime someone is looking to do anything, like 
human motivation, it always stems from a problem, whether it's in business or just even human instinct to solve something always stems from a problem. Um, you know, no business really finds product market fit without solving a problem first. And I think that that's just enough for people to, to figure it out. But trust me, we are not there. Like in North America, like if you grab 20 people off the street, I suspect over half of them will not know what an exchange traded fund is or manage the report. Like we're not there yet either. Um, but you're saying that you were, you're even further, further back in Europe. And maybe that's true. I'm not sure, but we're a long, long way away still, no matter where you go. And so that's why it's important that you and you guys and, and I have this conversation. It's important why you guys have your YouTube channel because there's a problem and you're trying to address it. Um, so yeah, it, it's a long way to, a long way to go still on the education side. Like you leave high school, you leave university, even with a business degree, like a business degree, you not know how to fire, t file your own taxes. That's pathetic. Like, that is absolutely pathetic. Um, and that's the reality. So there's no incentive. The incentives are not aligned for that problem to be fixed because, you know, I, I think uh, Andreessen Horowitz has, uh, like Mark Andreessen from Andreessen Horowitz, he's, he's come on several podcasts and said that education is the one industry that has not innovated since the Second World War. It is the only industry that he, he says, and he's, he's come out this on multiple podcasts, there's been virtually no innovation um, in the education sector. And I, 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 I agree. I think that that's true. I mean, look how everything else has changed. But university institutions, high school, still looks the exact same. Maybe they put some of the tests online with a basic you know, quiz software. That doesn't count. That doesn't actually change how you learn. Um, and it's usually going to be outside tools that students use and learn to drive innovation in, in education system, whether it's like, you know, the use of tools like Excel or now with, with artificial intelligence. It usually comes from the private sector and influences the public sector like education. But there has been... I'd be I'd be shocked to like think of an example of like what's really changed in the university system here in Canada or anywhere uh, in the past I don't know sixty years double my lifetime I would I would guess yeah no and on top of that there's this pressure from society right in many families that you have to get a PhD or a master you have to get a degree and in the U S there's this big issue about student debt right that's even more problematic yep. you know where you spend half a million dollars and then you're unemployed or you're making 100k yep. a year and then you have to live up to a lifestyle of the doctor right and then you're never going to be able to pay that, that that off we watched Dave, the dave ramsey show i think it's funny and sad yeah. at the same time to hear some of those stories agreed yeah and, and, and <laughs> i mean what's the solution i don't know i i got i got i got nothing i don't i don't know what it is it's highly complex and especially when You've built up so much, uh, so much debt, not only with like technical debt and process debt, but literal also financial debt from people who have gone through this system. So there's, there's debt more than just financial here. And trust me, there's lots of financial debt too. So uh, it's, it's, it's difficult. It's a difficult problem to fix, I think. It's been almost an hour and uh, we really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us. It was nice. Really enjoyed this conversation about your story and about stratosphere and investing in general. This is what we try to do on this channel. And uh, we hope that uh, we're going to be able to talk to you again in the future. And in the meantime, enjoy the uh, sunny days in Costa Rica. Have fun. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, Guy, Matt, it's a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thanks for giving me the opportunity to tell, uh, tell the story and, and uh, tell the world about Stratosphere. Uh, I cannot thank you guys enough. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye. Thanks.